morning, Southside. <clears throat> Grateful for any guests that are with us this morning. We just hope you're blessed and encouraged in our worship. Um, I just want you to note what time I got up so it, it's not me that went over. Um, turn to Psalm 51. I am going to throw out all of my introduction. Um, Psalm 51, what we're going to look at this morning, we've been journeying, learning about abiding in Christ, and we've been looking at what true and genuine faith is for the believer. And now this morning, what I want to look at is what is true, genuine repentance. There's a sorrow that is worldly and does not change. It does not transform a human. And so what I want to do this morning is I think there's a lot of false repentance and your life is not changing the way you wished or hoped. And so I want to come to Psalm 51 and learn a primer on how to repent biblically. And I'm going to call it a, a repentance that brings transformation and a repentance that sings. And I'm just asking that God would meet this church this morning and we'll close with a universal repentance together before our God. Um, Let's see. Why Psalm 51? I just told you. I'm moving. Okay. Let's just go to our God then and ask him to meet us. Father, I come before you now and I pray with uh, the fullness of this service now. Help us to just slow down and to come to this word that has a mighty message for all of our hearts. And so God, speak to us through your Holy Spirit and this inspired word that you've given to us. God, teach us what is true repentance and then grant us the gift for your word says that you're the one who grants repentance. You're the one who grants faith. They're both a gift from our God. As Christians, we're believing ones and we're repenting ones. That's how we walk with our God. So I pray this morning, Lord, that you would keep teaching us and understanding this relationship and how we walk with you, how we abide in Jesus Christ. And so I pray, Lord, um, fill it up more with understanding a biblical, genuine repentance for sin. Do more than we could hope or think this morning, God, I ask. Amen. There are several Psalms of the 150 that give us the exact setting that caused that Psalm to be penned or written. And it's somewhat rare but the one before us this morning, you'll notice that the top tells us what happened to inspire the writing of this psalm. It's a psalm of David. As David, uh, as Robert read to us, when Nathan came to the prophet and after he had gone into Bathsheba. And so this is a quick reminder as we begin then is who this man was. This is David. He's the shepherd boy. He's written songs of deep intimacy with God. He was the leader in, in the worship and going into the praise of God. He penned the great Psalm 23 that the Lord is my shepherd. One thing I've desired of the Lord to behold is beauty in Psalm 27. This was the one who stormed the giant Goliath and says, you will not taunt the living armies of God. This was the one who had a steadfast trust in the Lord and he would not raise his hand up against Saul when God would deliver him into his hand. He slew the 10,000s in battle. He was the king of Israel. He would be a prototype of the king of kings who would come. And this was the one who was given this title by God himself, a man after God's own heart. Yet now we're going to read of a sin so scandalous it will take your breath away. Uh, 2 Samuel, don't turn to it. It's what Robert read to us. A uh, royal rape, covering it up with murder of his king, one of his leaders. That, my friends, is the horrible context of Psalm 51. And so this morning, I want to ask you, is what do you do when you say yes to sin and no to God? What do you do when you've sinned and made shipwreck of a family or friends or kids or your church? What do you do with this kind of guilt and shame and sin? Because our society has no answer for it. It has no way to clear the guilty conscience. And so what we're going to come to this morning is pure gold. God does. He has an answer for your guilt and your shame as you sit here today. And I want to show you how fallen, broken, guilt-filled sinners can deal with sin rightly 
And at the end of the psalm, he, he's singing and he's full of joy and he's restored to his God. That's the kind of repentance that we're seeking. We need to get this. To be a church that deals with sin God's way. And as usual, it will be the opposite of the way the world deals with sin, what we look at now. And so what I see in this psalm, I preached it back when we were at two or three or four penguins. I don't remember the name of it. How many penguins? So Three? So when we were over there, I preached this, and I just wanted to come this morning to the, to the part, verse 16 and 17, of what's an acceptable sacrifice to God, but I got lost in the psalm, so we're going to go through the whole thing again. So I want you to just come with me. And we're going to look at four ways that David responded to his misery and sin. Verse 1, the first thing he does is he turns to his only hope. He doesn't turn to his own hands. He doesn't turn to, how do I fix it? He turns to his only hope. You are the man, David, and it pierces his heart. Have you ever heard those words by a human or by the Holy Spirit? You're the man, you're the woman, and that is the beginning of the grace of God. Where do you flee when you fall into sin, even gross sin? Where do you go? Do I look to my own hands to fix it? Do I look at all my accomplishments and my past? Do I do, I do as professionals tell you, don't feel guilt, it's not real? Do you lower the standard? You're the king. You deserve this. Everyone's doing this these days. Do I just curl up in a ball and be miserable and I just hope it goes away? Do I just listen to the enemy now that says, see, you can't even be a, a Christian. You're, you're done. You're finished. David has only one hope in his misery and in his sin. And he looks only to the grace of Almighty God. There's more in God than just holiness and justice and wrath. And David is going to look for that. God, the psalmist said, if you mark iniquities, O God, who can stand? But with thee there's forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. He turns to grace. Grace is God's favor to undeserving people. I think that misses it. It's God's favor to ill-deserving people. David deserves death. The law of Moses said for adultery and murder, you're to be killed. He deserves total destruction that's what he's merited. That's what David earned. But David knew more of the character of God, and he cries to this God, be gracious to me, O God, in verse 1. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Treat me in a way that I don't deserve. I deserve death. God, will you give me grace and mercy and pardon and forgiveness. Brethren, here's the only place of retreat in sin. And this is the test of your faith when you're in sin. Where do you flee? Where do you go? My God is gracious. God, treat me in a way I don't deserve. The foundation of the whole gospel. Do it according to your hesedness. And that's that beautiful Hebrew word of, of the covenantal love of God that he covenants to love you and not turn away from you. His loving kindness is his faithfulness. I am yours and you are mine. When you're in this kind of sin, you need a God who will not turn away from you. And David knew that God had committed hesedness and he will not lift his love and remove it. God, be gracious to me according to this covenantal love that you've made with me. Treat me with grace according to your steadfast love is the only hope for this man. Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, says Jesus. Abide in my love. I need the love of God. I need a love that's not gone now because of my sin. I'm going to tell you as clear as I know how. You will never find joy in forgiveness until you see the gracious, forgiving heart of your God. It will never be your own efforts to try to compensate for what you've done. God, I'm going to change. I'm going to show you a life of purity. Just give me a chance. I'll fix it. You're cornered and you're pinned, and there's only one way out. A God who's gracious according to his love and kindness. 
You will never get out of your own sin and guilt unless you believe this. You're sitting here this morning trying to make restitution for your sin. That was my whole life. Trying to prove to God that you're really sorry. And, and for us, it's tetelestai, it's finished. Jesus Christ has paid the price for your sins and he's died in your place so that they could be forgiven. No more sacrifice. God's pleased with the one that his son gave. The loving kindness of our God. That's the only hope for this man. Secondly, we got to cut deeper to get the biblical right repentance. And I think we stop too short in the Christian life. And so my goal this morning is that we keep digging in until it's gone. And I know to, to, to just stay in the same sin all your life, we, we got to cut in. We got to cut in. So David now begins to pray then for the cleansing of this sin. If you'll look in verse 2, <clears throat> wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Three different words for sin to point out every possibility of it. Here, blot it out, wash it, cleanse me. My sin is ever before me. He's sick over the stain and the filthiness. In the Psalm 32, I, I, I kept quiet and I tried to ignore and hide my sin and I'm dying and I'm sick and it's just affecting me. And now he's coming, wash it away, God, get rid of it. In verse 7, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop was a plant that had a shape and structure. It was almost like a small paintbrush. And do you remember the first time we saw it in the Bible? A few weeks ago when we studied the Passover, they were to take the hyssop and they were to put that blood on the door so when the wrath of God came, it would pass over the door. The slaughter of a lamb and the hyssop on the doorpost. The wrath of God would pass over and the firstborn child would be saved. Pass over my sin, O God. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. There's no other way to wash off the stain of sin and guilt. David has blood on his hands and rape and the captain of his army is just disgusted with it all. How can you cleanse it? How can you get that off a conscience? This is not something small. And the only answer is there's a fountain filled with blood and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And the promise of God is I'm going to remember your sins no more. Do you believe this? In the next chapter, he says, have you considered my servant David? There's no one as righteous as him on the face of the earth. I'll remember your sins no more. What a gospel. So in this sin, my only hope is the grace of God and I turn to it. And my only hope is that the cleansing of my sin by Jesus Christ can wash away my iniquity and my guilt. And the third thing is we got to keep cutting in. I want to go deeper. David now confesses why his sin is so serious. So I want you to hear this. Downplaying your sin isn't going to get what we're after this morning. Ignoring it. Lessening it. This is what I see lacking in the church. Sin has lost its weightiness and its seriousness. We've lost it. But David hasn't. Just a quick note. Wash me. Cleanse me. My transgressions. My sin. You know what you call that? Ownership. 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 No excuse making. No excuse. If she hadn't flirted with me, if you hadn't said that, I'm a man, you pushed me too far. If I said that, then I'm sorry. She makes me feel like a man. He makes me feel cared about. All this justification and rationalization, what we have here in true repentance is an ownership before God. This is sin. I like the illustration I heard a while back. Is, he says, if you pick up a log at the end of the half and you throw it, where does it go? Nowhere. And if you put the whole thing on yourself, you can throw it off and put it all on you so you can be free from the sin. 
Don't put it somewhere else. You know what the cause is of your sin? I wanted it. I chose it. I desired it more than you, oh God. Jonathan Edwards says, when you sin, you always do what you most wanted at the time of your choice. Don't put it off and explain it away. I chose this sin over you. Get to the root. It wasn't my parents. It wasn't my spouse. It wasn't my experiences. You can't get joy and transformation that way. Verse 3, my sin is ever before me. I can't get it out of my mind. The video just keeps playing. It's there when I wake up and it's there when I go to sleep. That's a good working conscience. Do not sear it. And I want to give you a remedy for that today. Please. And verse 4, against you and you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. I want you to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin this morning. It's a very intensive in the Hebrew. And it's against you and you only. To repeat it twice is to emphasize it. God, the sin is against you and you only. This is the deep, deep wound of the man after God's own heart in this psalm. And it's what I see lacking too much today. It's made me sad. My joy is gone. I, I, I didn't live up to my own standard. I think about how others are going to view me. I want you to get to this place. Cut in. God, the sin was against you. And you only. That's what's cutting so deeply is the God who's gracious and love and kindness and forgiving. David knew that. And I love when God says, I gave you everything, David. If you would have asked for anything, I would have given it. So you, don't you feel like that? You've given me so much, God. And if I just asked, you'd give me more. I've sinned against this kind, gracious God who's lavished mercy, love and kindness and grace upon me. It's you and you only. So what makes this wrong? It's, it's not so much that I trampled your law, but I trampled the merciful God who gave it to me. Against you and you only I have sinned. The loveliness of God I trampled. Fear of punishment can restrain some sin. God said I gave a government with a sword to try to restrain some external sinful behavior. But it can't do what we're looking for this morning. Only the love of God in Christ Jesus can transform your heart. And that's the kind of repentance that we're going after. What God has done in Christ is what writes the law upon my heart. What Jesus Christ did on the cross for me, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's it. David's broken heart is I trampled you, oh God, my shepherd. My shepherd. The Puritan Stephen Charnick put it well. He said, David is miserable here, not through fear. He's miserable through mercy. Religion tries to change your life through fear. And God changes your heart through the mercy that he's given to us in Christ Jesus. The mercy of God has brought in my heart the utmost hatred of sin and all of its roots. As I abide in Jesus Christ and love him, I have never hated sin more in my life. It was the spiritual adultery of my heart that caused the physical adultery. I, I adulterated you, God. I moved from you. I left you long before I grabbed Bathsheba. I let my heart drift. It said when kings go out to battle, and I stayed back and I took my pleasures. I took my ease. I earned it. I deserve a break. Oh God, he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He sinned because he lost the joy of his salvation. I think this is at the root of all the beginnings of sin. I've lost the joy of my salvation. I've lost your ravishing love in my heart. Go deeper. Why did you do that, David? I forgot you, God, because when they went out to battle, they took the Ark of the Covenant 
And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And I think David forgets the presence of God, that everything he's doing is before him. And Nathan comes and says, it was all done before God. And I think David's like, oh, what beauty is like your beauty? Oh God, that is why I thought I needed her. I lost you. What love is like your love? What arms are like your arms, oh God? David did not sin against law. He sinned against grace. My friend, what makes sin, sin, and I pray you hear this this morning, is against you and you only have I sinned. Nothing breaks my heart more and brings repentance than that. I chose sin over the loveliness and grace of my loving Father. You quit abiding in His love and you'll quit repenting except because of the circumstances that hurt your life. I love Joseph got it when Potiphar's wife grabbed him and said, sleep with me. And he goes, how could I do this great evil against God? The severity of David's sin was not so much the nature of the sin, but the greatness of the person that he sinned against. And you must have this, or sin will never be the offense that it should be to your heart. You'll never get at the roots of it and tear it out if you don't have that. And you know what I'm talking about as you sit here this morning. Any other reason, the sin will grow back. You pulled a weed and you left its root. And this truth will mortify sin and put it to death. God's new covenant in Jesus Christ makes sin, sin. I've loved you with an everlasting love. And then David vindicates God and not himself. In verse 4, you're justified when you speak and you're blameless when you judge. You're right to judge me for what I've done. And then he he just doesn't stop. He wants to intensify the guilt even more. If you'll look at me in verse 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. I'm a sinner from the core of my being. When I was conceived. I was already bent and twisted and off course. This is who I am. This is what I've come forth from from my mother's womb. And most use this as an excuse to lessen the weight of sin. David uses it to heighten it. I'm a mess, God. David owns his sin. It's the corruption of my heart. It's not I stumbled to something on a computer. My heart is evil and it loves sin. And it loves it more than you, God. Verse 6, he cries out, I've sinned against light. You desire truth in the innermost being, the new covenant. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. I know these things. I've sinned against light and revelation and what you've shared with me that he's written in all these psalms. And verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Only God can bring back my joy. How? By forgiveness. God, I need forgiveness for my sins. The Lord, I love it. Nathan said, the Lord has taken away your sin. Boom. It's true. You're forgiven, Nathan. True repentance, what it can do to a penitent sinner. Wasting away, dying in sin, shame and guilt. If you'll follow God's way of repentance and confession and believe, faith and repentance are just tied together. You can sing again this morning. I want you to quit doing what all the cults have taught us, to live under guilt and shame and just keep trying to clean up. And and you just walk in shame and guilt all day long. And the gospel says today, as you look and confess and turn to God, it can be made as white as snow. I'll remember your sins no more, cleansed and forgiven. And you can be like David singing rather than carrying this thousand pound weight on you the rest of your life. What a gospel. Don't stop short in your repentance of what God wants to give you. You can sing again. So he turns to his only hope. He prays for the cleansing of his sin with hyssop. He confesses why his sin is so serious. He does not downplay it. He owns it. And then he pleads for renewal in verse 11. 
Verse 10. Created me a clean heart. Oh God, this is the root. This is where it began. Renew a steadfast spirit within me, which is a picture of who David was. Restore me back to that sanity and that walk with you. Don't cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit, O oh God. This always accompanies true repentance. I want forgiveness for sure, but I want the root torn out. I want it removed. I want to be done with this sin once and for all. For what we know, David never did this sin again. Ever. Give me a new heart. Cleanse me, O oh God, and clean me. This is the heart of a true repentance. Restore my heart. A heart where all life flows. Renew. Give me a willing spirit, God. Fix me to the one who sat in the meadow and penned Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm satisfied and I'm fulfilled. And I hate to do this to you. You're going to be mad at me. Do not take thy Holy Spirit from me. I had a bunch of notes on that. Um, we're going to skip it. I got to stay on task, but I, I just want you to know this. Um, in the old covenant, that you're not sealed with the Spirit yet. And the Spirit would come upon people for anointing and calling, and Saul lost the Spirit from his sin. And I think David is crying out, keep using me, God. Don't be done with me, like Saul. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. The first thing that goes in sin is your joy. And then obedience becomes a burden. Sundays are a burden, same songs, bored, just a downward spiral. Could you be sitting there this morning because you haven't repented of sin like this the way David is teaching us? Verse 13 is interesting. Then, if you forgive me and renew my spirit and my steadfast way and heart, I'm going to teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Doesn't that seem out of place? What does a forgiving sinner want to do? What did we learn that the woman at the well, what did she do? That whole city got saved. She's rejoicing over her repentance and her forgiveness. The first thing you want to do when you get this is go tell of a God who forgives. He proclaimed the sweet mercy that you found in God. I want to tell everybody. When your sin's released, your guilt is removed. Oh, what David has been forgiven. The number one reason I hear people tell me why they don't evangelize, I just don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I'm given the message. And that's it. Your repentance isn't getting you to this place of full forgiveness and full acceptance and singing again. What I've been forgiven of, I want to be a witness to. I want to tell everybody of a God who forgives in Jesus Christ. I witness and testify of what I've seen and what I've received. So don't buy this lie that your failure keeps you from ever being used of God again. Throw that off this morning if you're carrying that around. I've blown it too bad. Stop. Come join David, my friend. I've messed up bad. But I've repented and I've found forgiveness. And as a broken sinner, let me lead people to Jesus Christ. Let me come tell them of the forgiveness that I have found. I got something better than sitting in guilt the rest of your life, feeling that God can't use you. Oh, receive this. Clean people, self-righteous people and legalists never lead people to Christ, only away from him. Broken sinners have dealt with their sin this way and been forgiven are a mighty instrument in the hand of God. And then verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. The easiest thing now is to walk in on a Sunday and just hit a note and all I want to do is sing praises to my God who has redeemed me and forgiven me and cleansed me. When, when you don't want to worship, it's because your heart has shriveled up in these truths. And when you're drinking up the full forgiveness and the mercy of God, I just want to sing and give praise to a God like this. 
This will lead to worship. And now with one minute left, here's the whole reason I picked this passage. It's good stuff. Uh, John Bunyan, um, one of the great Puritans, he was in prison. And the last book he ever wrote was called The Acceptable Sacrifice. And it was a whole book on this, these two verses. Um, if you can get a hold of it, it's incredible. And he, he thinks it's the whole Christian life that this is what God wants from his people. So what do I want to give to God? Come with me now. This is where this all leads. <coughs> For you, God, do, do not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would give it. You're not pleased with burnt offering. And, and so in verse 19, he's going to say, you, you do delight in sacrifices. And you're like, what's going on here? And it, it's the wrong heart that all I need to do is go give a dead animal and everything will be okay. And they started thinking that was really the, the main thing. And, and so the sacrifice that was brought, hear this, was subordinate to the heart of the one sacrificing it. It goes back as far as Cain and Abel. And so God isn't pleased with, if you come in and throw some money in an offering plate, he isn't pleased that I'm going to go to church every Sunday so that now I can be forgiven. He's not looking for that. Well, what are you looking for, God? Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Sermon on the Mount, we're studying young marrieds, and the way you enter into the kingdom is you come in poor in spirit. You look at your own righteousness and you realize all of your good stuff will never be enough to get you into the kingdom of God. And then you look at your sin and you start mourning over the magnitude of it. And then it makes you meek, humble, and gentle in the way you deal with people. And the kingdom of God is the humble that you go down to come up. It's about broken, humble sinners who know who and what they are before God and they know who and what he's done for them. And that's what the kingdom of God is about. Humble, broken people. And instead of the proud movers and shakers and haughty and self-righteous people, God says, those are the sacrifices that I love. It's a pleasing aroma in my nostrils is a broken spirit and contrite heart. Oh God, you won't despise. That's beautiful in God's kingdom and that's rejected in the earthly kingdoms. What a beautiful thing to give to God this morning. Martin Luther <coughs> knows another preacher named Martin. He says, how do I know then if I have a broken spirit? Well, a proud heart cannot receive mercy. So the reason you can't forgive yourself and you stay in this is your proud heart thinks, you, I, I got to do something to get it. A proud heart can't receive mercy. God doesn't want all our motions and external service, a broken spirit that joys in the grace of God alone. How do I know if I have it? I can pray this psalm truly. Go follow everything we just looked at. That's how you know, is I've seen my sin and I've looked to God and I've dealt with it and it's against you and you only have I sinned. Create in me a new heart. Let me sing praises for your forgiveness. That's where a broken spirit and contrite heart flow from. The self-righteous, and let me know if this is you this morning. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Just kidding. How, how could David do such a thing? I would never do that. I would never do that. Get in line. You're next. Don't stop short of joy and your repentance. Do not stop short. God wants you to come all the way to full forgiveness and joy again in him. I want you to step back into the story as we close. Nathan comes and he confronts David. And David says, I've sinned against God. And, and just so quickly, Nathan goes, the Lord's taken away your sin. Isn't that beautiful? Just like that. Do you believe in instantaneous forgiveness? I have to prove it. I got to make up for it. I'm the older son and the prodigal son. Was David forgiven? Yes, he was. Has anyone seen in my servant David? No one's like righteous like that. David talks about his own righteousness in a few chapters. You got, a, you got amnesia, brother. 
David has a son named Solomon. And from that line, Messiah is going to come. It's going to come from he and Bathsheba. And so I want you to hear this. Does God forgive the penitent? Yes, he does. And the sword's not going to depart from your house. There are consequences, but you are on plan A, David. And I'm still going to have a Messiah that's going to come from your line. So I want you to know if you've blown it, God still has you on plan A for how he wants to use you and glorify himself. David is just such an exhibit. But how? The Lord's taken away your sin. What about Uriah's mother? How does she feel about the king who raped his daughter and killed his son-in-law? Oh, your sin's forgiven. That doesn't seem very just to me. We're going to close in Romans 3, if you'll flip to it. One of my favorite passages in this Bible. And I'll let you go after this beautiful point. <clears throat> because he didn't just let David go. And I want you to hear the beautiful plan of God. It gives life to the whole Old Testament of how God passed over sin when they repented like that. Come with me to Romans 3. Let's start in verse 24, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I was born in iniquity and in sin I was conceived. Being declared not guilty before God is justified. And it's a gift by His grace. It's all His doing. And His doing was through the redemption of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, paying the penalty for our sins. And God put Him up publicly on a cross as a propitiation in His blood to, to take the wrath of God off of us. And I tell you this, it was to demonstrate his righteousness. And here's our answer to David. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. He passed over David's sin. And then so that at this time with Jesus on the cross, it's a demonstration of his righteousness. God is righteous so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. He passed over David because he would not pass over his own son, and the wrath of God was poured out on his son for the sin of David. And the wrath of every sin that Ken Murphy did was put on Jesus, and he punished him right there. So now he can pass over and cleanse me and wash me and make me clean and whole before him. To God be the glory for this life. And we're going to close out with repentance, but I just, the one thing I just want to mention, if there's anyone who's come here and you haven't been born again, there's two things I hear in my evangelism. One is, I'm, I'm, I'm good enough to get there. With my religion and all my works and the things that I'm doing can get me into the presence of God. And that will never get you in because of standards perfection. And the other thing I hear is, I'm too bad. I've done too many bad things for God to forgive me. And I want you to look at David and I want you to see his sins put upon the cross and God saying, you're forgiven. David, it's gone, it's washed. You're completely forgiven before God this morning. And so I pray that you would look away from your badness and look to the Christ who died on a cross for all your sins so that you could be forgiven this morning. And you would look at all your righteousness and it would become a filthy rag and you would cry out to God for his and his alone in Jesus Christ. To that one he will look upon and he'll save. I offer that to you this morning because God offers that to any this morning that would need that salvation. And then just corporately as we close, I just want in my closing prayer is do you have that kind of repentance and do you need this this morning? So just before God, the, the new covenant is you don't need a minister, you don't need a priest. You, right before God, do you want to repent like that this morning and own your sin and quit blaming everyone else? Call it out and say, God, it was against you. I, I've chosen this sin because I, I love it more than you and I've sinned against you. And that you would now look to the mercy of God alone for your help, not your penance and not the things you're going to go clean up and fix. Look only to the mercy of God and let your heart sing again this morning in the presence of your God. Let's go to our...
our Abba. Oh, Father. I pray this morning as a corporate body. Or with any guilt that we're carrying around still. Still trying to clean up enough so we can get forgiveness. Still not cutting all the way in to be set free from these sins. God, I'm asking this morning that there be a million dead sins on the ground here at Southside. Let them look at the one who hung on that cross and propitiated the wrath of God for their sin, who paid the redemption price that needed to be paid. He died for us. God, let that beauty and glory and grace cause us to hate every sin that still remains, the sins that we're carrying in our hearts this morning and the sins that we've done all week. God, as a people of God, let us find a full forgiveness. Let us have them like hyssop and be washed and be cleansed. God, that's your delight and your glory. And so I pray that hearts would right now be set free. Lord, create in me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me. Set me right again in this beautiful, sweet relationship with full forgiveness and full acceptance and a love that we have now learned that my sin cannot turn Christ's heart away from me. Let us abide in that. Let us believe it and let us live in it and let this empower us to go serve, to go tell others about a great Christ like this. Let it, let it open up lips that are, can't even speak the glorious gospel because they're weighed down in guilt and shame. God, bring freedom to the sons and daughters of God this morning. Bless us. In Jesus Christ, I pray.